today on numerical methods. I like to continue on the generation of random numbers. And clearly the motivation for the generation of random numbers was our previous session on the Monte Carlo method, which then was reformulated as an integration method because you can inter interpret the um, expectation as an integral. Uh, and we got here this nice result, yeah, that here our uh, Monte Carlo integral, which is just given by this really nice and simple methods, converges in some sense uh, to the integral of the function f. And well, we evaluated this here on a single event, so um, that it is we got a sequence out of these IID random variables, a sequence of random numbers. So, and then we got the result that here our Monte Carlo integral, so that was then the way how we really apply it in the computer, evaluate the function at random points and just uh, take the average of the results. So this converges in some sense yeah, to the integral of this function f. And also a nice result was that actually this really works also in higher dimensions. And uh, so now the question is how to generate this sequence xi. Okay, and we had a first uh, session on random number generation. And in our first session, we were looking at the so-called pseudo-random number generators. So just algorithms that generate some kind of sequence that really looks random. Okay, and today we have a very nice uh, result, yeah, the coxma lafka inequality. And before I come to this, well, let's think again about our sequence. So we had this nice result that here our Monte Carlo average, so a random valuations, or well, valuations at random points, f of xi, converges to this integral. And we derive this from some probabilistic results, but um, really it does not matter that the xi occur in random order. So it does not matter that the xi occur in random order. In fact, uh, we could really sort the sequence and the Monte Carlo integral would still be the same. Huh? I mean, if you take the sum over some numbers, it could be, it could be a sorted sequence. So the question is a little bit, um, what is now the property uh, that has to be fulfilled by this sequence xi? Um, that we get a good approximation. And for this question, let's go back to a picture which I already created. So in the previous session, we had this picture here. And let's look again, maybe if I take fewer points. So these were 1000 points. So generated in two dimensions. So I draw 2000 random numbers and populate 1000 two dimensional vectors from it. So if I just take 100 points, the picture looks like that. And then you spot that there are certain regions here where you have very few points. So this space here is quite empty. And then on the other hand, there are some regions where you have quite many points. Yeah? So there are some clusters where you have more points. So there are some more here. And maybe also that one here is a region where we have many points. 
clearly this is a consequence of the randomness, but is it really a good property? I mean, just think of um, a function where actually the function is maybe zero over a large region. And uh, then the function just takes values here in this region. Okay, then our integral uh, would be zero yeah, because we do not have a sample point in this region. So maybe this is not a good property to have such, uh, such a structure that we have large empty spaces or large structures. So um, indeed, um, we could order the sequence and maybe the sequence could have more structure. And I would like to motivate this uh, thing with a small code session. So let's start with a small code session. So last time we already created one dimensional integration algorithms. So we had here the Simpsons rule. So first we defined uh, an interface. So um, our class provides the integration rule by providing a function integrate that integrates a function, uh, the integrand uh, from lower bound to upper bound. So everything is one dimensional. And we implemented this interface by the Simpsons rule, which is just a very special choice of discretization points. Yeah, so you maybe remember that. And we implemented a Monte Carlo integrator, which is just a sequence of sample points that is generated from a random number generator. And then you evaluate the integrand at this random point. Okay, so since the random generator generates between zero and one, I have to shift to the uh, interval of interest from lower bound to upper bound. And since this is a scaling, yeah, uh, I have a du by dx, which is just range. So I have to use the rule of substitution and scale here with this scaling. Okay, so it's just the sum divided by the number of sample points. That's just our um, integral. And we implemented um, a unit test for this testing. Uh, well, in the last session, we had maybe different parameters, but we were testing integrate the cosine. Uh, we know the, the correct solution here is the sine. Uh, integrate from these uh, bounds with these number of points uh, using this integrator. And we had the same here for the um, Simpsons integrator. So you see the two tests are just identical, just the integrator is different. And when I run these tests, we can just compare um, the results using these two different integrators. And you see here, Simpson's rule is really very good. You know, it's just 100 uh, and one points. Yeah. Um, so let's see, maybe I do the output here a bit nicer. So, so now it's aligned. No, okay. So you see that here, Simpson's rule is really very good with just these uh, 101 points. And my Monte Carlo integrator is also using 100 points. So we would expect that the accuracy is something divided, something like one divided by square root of 100, which is 10. Yeah, and we see, okay, this here is, um, something like one divided by 10. Yeah, okay, it's 0 0.6 divided by 10. There's a small constant in front. Yeah, so that looks reasonable. Um, let's create another integration rule. So I create here a new class and I call that now quasi Monte Carlo integrator, one dimensional. I would like to implement here my integrator interface. Okay, so my, my IDE already populates here this class. I have to implement this code here. Um, of course, also um, this one has a property, the number of uh, sample points. And I need a constructor where I can pass this parameter number of sample points to this class. And now I like to do the integration. And let's now 
do the following. Uh, avoid large regions of um, empty space or large clusters by just using an equidistant distribution. Okay, let's try. So let's generate the simple points. So this is my, my, my double stream. Uh, I use an integer stream. So a sequence of integers. So from zero to number of sample points. And then I use a map that maps the index i to just say i divided by number of sample points. So that's just a sequence that is um, equidistributed, equidistant sequence, okay? So zero, one divided by n, two divided by n, and so on. And now um, perform the Monte Carlo evaluation. So I take the sum. So I take the sample points. I evaluate the function on it. Yeah, so that's my integrand here. Um, of course, the sample points are between zero and one. So before I can evaluate the function, I need to transform the sample points. So x maps to, uh, say lower bound plus uh, range times x and the range is upper bound minus lower bound. Okay, so and from that, yeah, so this is just the evaluation, I take now the sum. Okay, and the integral is now sum multiplied with range, yeah, because I did this uh, translation and shift and scaling um, divided by number of sample points. So I hope that this is correct. Okay, so I have a new uh, integrator and this integrator uses a very structured sequence. So it's a little bit in between uh, Simpson's rule. Yeah? So Simpson's rule used coefficients two, four, two. Yeah? So very special coefficients also on a very regular grid. Uh, Monte Carlo used uh, random numbers. And uh, so this is a little bit in between. Okay, so let's uh, create another test here. So I can just uh, copy now this test class and I call it quasi, quasi Monte Carlo integrator test. So I have another test here. So, and I just replace here what I wrote. Uh, so with my new class. And hopefully if I now run this test, he should perform an integration using this additional integration method. And I did a mistake. Okay, so where is my mistake? Okay, so here this is an integer division. This should be a floating point number. Okay, so now it works. So good that we have a unit test and that we spotted this mistake. Yeah? So otherwise, if you do integer division, it is say two divided by five, which rounds to integer zero yeah? or six divided by five would round to one. So um, actually that's a mistake I quite often do. Okay, so we have a new integration rule. We use a very simple, um, sequence and way this method is really good this looks as if the convergence rate is not one divided by square root of n this looks like one divided by n let's try so if i uh, go to the test yeah so say and i use 1001 because simpsons likes uh, odd number of points for all the three guys so I use 1000 for all the three guys and I run the test again. It's now here some, well, before it was 10, now it is a little bit better than one divided by 100. Yeah? 
Uh, okay, but that one is already added at a 10 to the minus four. Okay, so it is, it looks a little bit like one divided by 1000. Okay, so th this is really interesting. So uh, the randomness of the sequence, while last session I, I showed you that with respect to this high dimensionality, randomness is a feature, the randomness is actually not important. And um, I can show you one small other thing here. So this is my quasi random number, my quasi Monte Carlo integration algorithm here. And um, let's take here a slightly different uh, sequence. So this sequence is uh, zero, one divided by n, two divided by n, and so on. So we could also shift everything by half and place the point in the center instead of to the left of the interval. So if I use that, it is just a shift by one divided by two times number of sample points. So a shift by half of the interval. And let's uh, run now the test uh, again. Okay, and I get a 10 to the minus seven, okay? So nine times 10 to the minus eight. So that's really, well, a good method. Okay, very simple. Uh, much simpler to implement compared to what we did here for the Simpsons integrator, yeah, which is a quite complicated rule on generating the points. Okay, so that was uh, uh, some motivation. So generating some equidistribution looks as if this works even better than choosing random points. So what is the property of the sequence that gives us a good convergence? And actually it's this property that you already spotted here in the picture. Uh, maybe we should avoid to have clusters where we have many points and spaces where we have very few points, empty spaces, at least if we like to have uniform distribution. So maybe it should be uniform. So here in the script, this is just uh, what I just did, a small code session with an equidistant uh, partitioning. And we implemented here this quasi Monte Carlo integrator 1D. And we observed that actually this looks as if this converges even a bit better than the true pseudo random Monte Carlo method. So the property uh, which is important here, so is a property of the sequence. And here you find the definition of this property. It's called the discrepancy. There's also the star discrepancy. We will look at this. Um, later. And this is just what we had in the picture intuitively now written in mathematical terms. Okay, if you have, um, say, an interval, so I'm immediately looking at this here, or I'm looking at this here in d dimensions. So this here is actually um, a vector a, which is describing the lower left um, bound of this uh, interval rectangle, uh, cube, yeah, whatever, uh, and a vector B, which is then describing the other point. So A, B as an interval is just here the Cartesian product. So I have here the point A1, A2, and here the point B1, B2. So that here is then the rectangle that goes here from a1 to B1, so the length is B1 minus A1, and here it goes from A2 to B2, so the length is A2 minus. Okay, so this is just the generalization of my interval in D dimension. And in order to be uniform, what do we expect? Well, um, this is a unit cube, so the full volume of this object here is one. So this guy here is 
the measure that measures the volume yeah, or the size, if it's just an interval, of this guy uh, from A to B. So this is just measure, measuring the volume. So we just define it by here, the product of the lengths of the edges. And then we would expect if this is uniform that inside the volume, we have proportional many points as the size of the volume. So here I count the number of points that we have in this cube. So the number of points that are in this cube. And we divide this by N, the amount of points we would expect in uh, AB is lambda AB times N. Okay, so if lambda AB is one half, yeah, we have just cut the interval in one half. So we would uh, expect that we would have one half times N, uh, if N is even, yeah, one half times N points in this area. If we have too few points, it's maybe bad. If we have too many points, it's maybe bad. So we take here the absolute value of the difference. Okay, so that's, that's maybe a reasonable measure. Yeah, It gives us how much do we deviate from true uniform distribution. Um, of course, if you have an interval, say for example, I draw here some interval. Okay, and we have say, for example, two points here and here. Okay, then I can find an interval where I have too many points. Namely, I could just take here this small interval. So this interval is very small. So just using two points, I would maybe expect just a fraction of a point. But of course I can have either one or two or zero points. So there are too many points in this interval. And there are also too few points in that interval. Yeah? So it's not possible to have a sequence with discrepancy zero. But the measure just maybe tells me if I have something that is too, um, too empty or too crowded. So for example, if you take this example here, where I now place the two points here, then the discrepancy is clearly worse. Yeah? For example, you could create the same size interval and have now two points in it, or you can create a, create a much larger interval without any point. You know? So the, clearly the discrepancy of the second guy is much larger than the discrepancy of the first guy. Okay, so that's maybe an interesting measure to measure how uniform is a sequence. You know, how uniform is a sequence filling my space. Um, the star discrepancy is just a little bit simpler definition. I use A equals zero. So I'm just considering all the intervals that are starting in zero. You know? So they are just attached to the left end. Um, of course you can combine some of these intervals to create some inner block, yeah? So take a larger one, cut something out. So clearly the star discrepancy contains all the information. It's just maybe a little bit different number. And that's covered here by this remark. So if you have this star discrepancy, then the following result holds. It's of course always smaller than the discrepancy because I just test with fewer intervals. Yeah? I just use a very special selection of intervals to test the discrepancy. But the, it is also an upper bound if we take here some constant, uh, which just depends on the dimension, d to the power of 
uh, two to the power of d. So you see in one dimension, there's a factor of two yeah, that you can get with the star discrepancy. So the star discrepancy can be smaller by a factor of one half if you are in one dimension. Um, and it's maybe easier to work here with this guy here. So with this star discrepancy. So in the next uh, theorem, etc., this guy will appear. Okay, so here in the definition, we take the supremum over all possible A, B. Huh? So it appears as if it's quite complicated to calculate this, um, this measure. Huh? We have to check all possible combinations of, um, yeah, of points, all possible points here in the unit cubes zero one yeah, to the power of D. Well, in fact, uh, not. Yeah, If you look here at our picture here below, yeah, so you see uh, you make the discrepancy worse, so larger, and I'm taking the supremum. If I just make this interval here a little bit larger, okay? Um, also here, yeah, if I make this a little bit larger, I would make the discrepancy again larger. And the number yeah, is growing because this guy here stays constant and this guy here is changing. Yeah? I change the endpoint, so I make the interval larger, so this volume grows until there will be another point that falls into the interval. So until, for example, here below, I go to this end. So some points falls into the interval. So this is like a little bit like a zigzag curve. If you make the, if you move a bound of the interval, uh, the guy grows yeah, until a new point pops in. Yeah, or it shrinks, yeah, depending on the sign, yeah, but uh, it always goes into to one direction and we have here the um, absolute value. Yeah. So um, it changes linear until a new point pops in. And for that re uh, reason, I just have to test or to calculate this expression. So by this expression, I mean here, take the number of points that are in a certain interval divided by N. So this here is number of points in the interval zero X. So I just use the star discrepancy. So I start in zero and I'm ending in some X divided by N. I just test this for all values X where I have a point in the sequence. So I test this for all points X here where I have a point in the sequence. Well, not precise, I will make this precise. And I just calculate this difference. Well since this discrepancy is discontinuous at the point, it can be that it is at the maximum before the point, or it is at the maximum after the point or at, or at the point, yeah? So actually I have to test both. I have to test the interval um, that has X included, and I have to test the interval that has X not included. So that's with X not included. Um, well, I tested for all points. So if you are in one dimension, that's now maybe an easy thing. So let's draw a small picture here. So here is zero, here is one. So we have a few sample points, for example, like these three sample points. Then we are testing, say, with some interval here, we are calculating the discrepancy. There is zero point in this interval and lambda is growing here like a linear function, okay? So up to this point here, 
where suddenly X enters. And then I'm jumping down by a certain amount. Okay, so what's the amount by what, by, by what this uh, jumps down? This amount is just the one divided by N here. So this size here is one divided by N and the function continues to go up and then it jumps down again and it goes up and it jumps down again and then it goes up. Yeah, and in the end, I have N points inside and the volume has size uh, uh, one. So it looks a little bit like that. And we measure the discrepancy at these points, yeah, because these are the points where the absolute value is um, uh, at the maximum, yeah. So these are the candidates. Uh, well, this is for one dimension. So this here is the example d equals one. Um, in higher dimension, actually, we have to check every dimension. Uh, separately. So this means I take here not all the sequence points that I test, I take all the components. So the generalization in one second. So the generalization in D dimension, so is that I take here J from one to D, and then I'm looking at the component of the ice point. Uh, this defines the set gamma j for every point. And then I'm creating the Cartesian product of all those components. In higher dimensions, yeah, we have here also the last point in every component. This means if we have the example x1, y1, x2, y2, we actually have to check nine different rectangles. So this would lead to gamma of x is equal to, and then we have x1, y1, x2, y1, and the last point one, y1, and we check the interval always from zero to that end point. Yeah? And you see that there is then check the whole x interval and just look into the y direction, which is the last one. And we have that now for all combinations, x1, y2, x2, y2, and 1, y2. And the last one is x1, 1. So go over the whole y interval and check the different, different x intervals. So we check all the possible boxes. And that here is actually check the whole um, interval. Actually, I believe the last one is, can be left out, right? Because there the discrepancy is zero. <clears throat> okay, so that was um, the generalization here in two dimensions with two points. Okay, so we have to test all possible uh, rectangles with these uh, endpoints. Uh, so now I have a formula. No, I mean, it's very intuitive in one dimension. Yeah, you just go from left to right to through all intervals and check uh, at these extreme points, a point is in the interval or points out of the interval, the discrepancy. So this uh, measure here is now of our interest. So the function that I have plotted below is actually this function here. Okay, and you just check this function at the points uh, from, your, from your sequence. So now I have a nice uh, formula that allows me to express this discrepancy.
Okay, so here's the same example again, because I will use this um, example later again for another property. So here we have five points. So n equals five, I have five sample points. Uh, sample points are at 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and so on. And you then plot here this function. So this here is actually the function here. And you check the function at these points here. And this guy here is now actually giving us our star discrepancy. Okay, so this is our D star. Yeah, so that's the largest distance we have from the uniform case. And you see that maybe the best thing would be to uh, really move this guy here over here and have something that goes like that. Okay, that would be much better. Okay, so now we have a property that characterizes how uniform is the sequence. The next thing is that we need for the result, which I would like to uh, yeah, show, also a characterization of what is the variability of the function f. Um, so may maybe we do a small break here and let's do that in the next session.